In our last lecture, we discussed the central importance of proteins as the biological molecules that make things work in living systems through their roles as controllers of biochemical reactions, structural elements that hold parts of the cell together, motors that make things move, signals, and so forth. Let me remind you of two important take-home messages from that earlier discussion. First, remember that the function of a protein, what it does for the cell, depends almost entirely on its shape. The three-dimensional configuration of each protein determines its physical and chemical properties, which in turn allow the protein to serve its unique function. Second, remember that the three-dimensional shape of a protein depends almost entirely on the linear sequence of the building blocks, the amino acids that make up that protein. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids. An average protein might have a few hundred amino acids, and if you get the right sequence of those few hundred amino acids, the shape of the protein emerges. So proteins are the workhorses. Their shape's determined by their sequence. How do we get a protein of a particular sequence built? Now, there are two questions here that we need to start addressing. Uh, of course, very related. First is, what is the blueprint that we're going to use to build proteins physically made of? That is, what kind of molecule is it? And second, how does that blueprint, how does that molecule actually work to code information about the sequence of amino acids in a protein? It's the first question that we're going to address in today's lecture. What kind of molecule serves as the blueprint for making proteins? Now, on one hand, that question seems like it's pretty simple. But interestingly, that was one of the questions that really defined molecular biology in the 20th century. What we really want to know, and the big picture that we're aiming to go to here eventually, is how this blueprint acts as a code for making proteins. But before we could understand how the code works, we had to understand what the code itself is actually made of. And this is the smaller piece of the puzzle we want to understand next. Now, of course, today, everybody knows the simple answer to this question. We all know that the code is something that we'll call a gene. These genes are found on chromosomes. We've all heard this, and we also know that these genes somehow involve DNA. Now, these first two parts, that genes, or what we now call genes, were where the code resides, and more importantly, that genes somehow were on chromosomes, actually was already known at the very beginning of the 20th century. This was known from the work of early cell biologists Walter Sutton and Theodore Bovary are actually two of the most important here, who discovered that the particular and somewhat peculiar movement of chromosomes that occurs when cells divide to make reproductive cells, cells that we call gametes, that are involved in sexual reproduction, that the movement of chromosomes during that event corresponded to patterns of transmission of traits between parents and their offspring. These patterns of trait transmission between parents and offspring actually had been discovered earlier by the Austrian monk Gregor Mendel, and we're going to talk about his work in just a couple of lectures. So they knew about Mendel's work, they saw how chromosomes moved, and they developed what's now called the chromosomal theory of inheritance, which basically means the way the chromosomes move is somehow related to the way that inheritance occurs, and therefore, following the concept that we're trying to develop here, somehow related to how information is stored. The information has to be on chromosomes. Okay, so we know that chromosomes are made of DNA, but how do we know that? And are they really made of DNA? Let me begin to explain how that became known by going back again to the earlier part of the 20th century to the work of an English physician named Frederick Griffith. Because this experiment that I'm about to describe really provided the first insight into how to get at the chemical nature of genetic information. Now, Griffith was, an, uh, was a physician, and he wasn't interested in the molecular basis of inheritance or the molecular basis of genetics at all. Instead, he was addressing a much more applied problem. He was studying Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a bacteria that, as its name suggests, causes pneumonia in humans. What Griffith wanted to do was develop a vaccine against this particular organism, because pneumonia caused by this organism actually often proved fatal. This was before the advent of antibiotics. 
Now, as often is the case for disease-causing bacteria, there were different strains of this particular organism that varied in their virulence. In other words, they varied in how likely they were to induce the disease and thus to cause death. Griffith was working with two strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae. And let me just name those for you. He was working with what we call the S strain on the one hand. This is a virulent strain. This is a deadly strain, okay? It's called S because uh, if you grow it in a colony on a little auger plate, um, it actually looks kind of shiny and smooth. So he called it the S strain, the shiny strain. And this is the deadly strain. And then he had another strain, which he called the R strain, which was non-virulent. If you got the R strain, you might be a little sick, but you wouldn't die. It wasn't a big deal. It's called the R strain because this, same, this strain of bacteria, if you grew it in a little colony, looks kind of rough on the surface. So it's called the R strain. Now, an important thing to note is that these strains of this bacteria did what we call breed true. In other words, as they reproduced, their offspring had the same properties as they did. In other words, S-strain bacteria gave rise to more S-strain bacteria and so on. In other words, the difference between the S-strain and the R-strain bacteria somehow must be genetically encoded. So what did Griffith do? Well, Griffith was using the approach that was pioneered much earlier by Louis Pasteur, um, which was to take the uh, organism that you wanted to develop a vaccine for and kill it so that no longer could harm you, but nonetheless would perhaps induce some sort of immune response if injected, say, in uh, a subject. So the idea was to take S-strained bacteria, kill them. In the way that Griffith did this, the common way to do this is you just heat them up in solution and they all die. And then you take these dead S-strain bacteria and you inject them, say, into a laboratory mouse and see if that mouse develops immunity. The mouse wouldn't die if you injected S-strain bacteria that had been killed because they're dead. But the parts of the bacteria that are injected might nonetheless induce an immune response by a mechanism that will um, uh, get to briefly very much later on in the course. This is a great idea, but it didn't work. And it often doesn't work. In other words, there wasn't enough left somehow of these dead S-strain bacteria to induce an immune response. So if you inject these in a mouse and then inject live S-strain bacteria, the mouse would die. It didn't become immune. Now, another common technique that was used then and now to develop um, immunity, to develop some sort of vaccine, was to inject not only the dead offending organism, but some related organism that was less virulent. In this case, the R-strain bacteria. The idea here is that the live R-strain bacteria because they're alive, will induce the organism to develop a full immune response, but it's not going to kill the organism, and that development of a full immune response will somehow pick up some immunity to the dead S-strain bacteria. This is a common technique, and it often works. So what Griffith did then was he killed some S-strain bacteria and injected those S-strain bacteria in with living R-strain bacteria and saw what happened to the mouse. What he hoped would happen is that the mouse would develop immunity to the S strain, but what happened instead was very unexpected and unfortunate for the mouse. The mouse died. Now this is a surprising result when you think about it. It's highly unexpected because what's being injected into the mouse are dead S strain bacteria that wouldn't kill the mouse and live R strain bacteria that wouldn't kill the mouse. So nothing was injected in the mouse that should kill it, and yet the mouse died. What um, Griffith found out when he dissected the mouse was that inside the poor dead mouse were living S-strain bacteria. He injected dead S-strain, and when he took the mouse apart, he found living S-strain. What Griffith concluded from this work, and correctly, was that somehow the living R-strain bacteria had taken up something from the dead S-strain bacteria. They had incorporated part of the dead S-strain bacteria into them 
And that somehow transformed the R strain into the S strain. Griffith later showed that you didn't even need the mouse. You could do this in a beaker. If you put dead S strain and live R strain bacteria in a beaker, the live R strain, some of them, would become transformed into live S strain bacteria. So these bacteria then were incorporating material, and that's an interesting process on its own. But from our point of view, what's really interesting is that the material that they incorporated must somehow be genetic material. It must somehow have information in it. Because how else could the R strain bacteria now become virulent like an S strain bacteria? The difference between S and R had to have something to do with genetically transmitted information. So the transformation of the R into S by accumulating or acquiring something from that S must involve genetic information. That's a very interesting finding. What Griffith did was he left it there. I mean, of course, this was only 1929 when he was doing this work. He said that he had discovered what he called transforming principle. The transforming principle in this sense being the stuff, whatever it is, that turned living R strain into living S strain that they took from dead S strain. Our interest in this, and in fact the interest of the scientists who followed this, was that somehow this transforming principle, this transforming stuff, must be genetic material. So all we had to do then is find out what the transforming principle was made of, and we'd have the genetic material. So what kind of molecule was it, scientists began to ask. Well, in the early part of the 20th century, when Griffith published this work, there was generally an assumption that the genetic material must be a protein. And why did they think that? Well, I mean, they thought it for the reason that we went through last lecture. Pretty much everything that happens in a cell, and they knew this even back then. They had already begun to understand the complexities and diversities of, a diversity of protein uh, function and structure. Pretty much everything that's important that goes on in a cell is done by a protein. So it makes sense that if you've got something complex and important that's being done in a cell, like providing information in this case, then it's probably going to be a protein. Now, they had good reason to suspect even back then that proteins were probably involved specifically from the chromosomal theory of inheritance. Remember I told you that people knew back then that the way that chromosomes moved corresponded to trait transmission in humans and other organisms. So chromosomes must somehow have the genetic material. So they asked, what are chromosomes made of? And they did some biochemistry and they found out that chromosomes actually are made of proteins and some nucleic acids, DNA to be specific. Now, by weight, if you analyze the content of a typical chromosome in a eukaryotic cell, there's five to ten times more protein than there is DNA. So they said, okay, there's a lot of protein in those chromosomes. That's consistent with the idea that it must be um, proteins. Now, another thing that was going against nucleic acids, DNA specifically, in this context, and we haven't talked about this specifically yet, is that if you look at what nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are made of, they, like proteins, are polymers that are made up as a string of monomeric, little monomer subunits. These are the, the nucleotides that are all strung together. Proteins, as we've learned, are made up of 20 different kinds of amino acids. Nucleic acids are made up of only four different kinds of nucleotides. Another thing that they knew about nucleic acids was that they're actually structurally quite boring. We've already talked in detail about how proteins have these complex structures that determine their function. Well, by and large, and especially back then, nucleic acids just seemed to be strings that lay there. They didn't have these kinds of very complex structures. So the sequence of the building blocks of nucleic acid seemed rather simple, only four things. The structure of the nucleic acid, if that had anything to do with its function as an information-bearing molecule, seemed kind of simple and maybe not very useful because it wasn't nearly as complicated as proteins. So everybody assumed that it must be proteins that were somehow holding the code. Now, there was one nagging piece of evidence that argued against the idea of proteins. And this has to do with the fact that if you heat proteins up in general, they break down. They break down because those 
um, chemical interactions that we talked about in the last lecture that hold proteins in particular complex shapes start to themselves break apart as the heat rises. And so what happens is the protein um, denatures, as we say. It actually loses its configuration and, and stretches out or changes its shape. So literally what that meant was the problem here is that when uh, Griffith had heated up those S-strain bacteria to kill them, he probably denatured a lot and maybe all of the proteins in them, or at least some. So there was some evidence that it might not be proteins, but nonetheless, most biochemists thought that they should be looking at proteins in the early part of the 20th century. So how do you actually answer this question then? How do you go and ask yourself, what is the transforming principle made of? Well, back then, the way to do this was through biochemical procedures that would selectively break down particular kinds of biological molecules. In fact, this kind of work was done in the early 1940s, really quite a long time after Griffith's first discovery, um, by three researchers at the Rockefeller Institute, what's now the Rockefeller University in New York, Oswald Avery, Macklin McCarty, and Colin McLeod. These guys were biochemists who had been developing relatively sophisticated techniques at that time for selectively breaking down different classes of biological molecules. Remember, we've got these four major classes to work with that we've talked about. We've got proteins, we've got nucleic acids, we've got carbohydrates, which are sugars and so forth, and we've got lipids, which are fats and so forth. So if what you could do is take a beaker of transforming principle from experiments that were done in the same way that Griffith might have done them, and selectively break down each of these classes of of um, biological molecule, then you could ask which biomolecule, when it's broken down, causes transforming principle to no longer work. So, I mean, this is the way you do the assay. You have some sort of transforming assay with things like S-strain or R-strain bacteria, although by that time many other kinds of bacterial systems were being used. You extract from um, a solution a particular, you know, some substance which you would call transforming principle if you were Griffith, and then you treat that solution biochemically in selective ways to selectively knock out the proteins or the nucleic acids, or the carbohydrates, or the lipids. And then you ask, which one, when it's broken down, ends up causing transforming principle to no longer transform? So they did that, and here's what they found. They could break down the carbohydrates, no problem, still got transformation. They could break down the lipids, no problem, still got transformation. They could break down the proteins, and there was no problem, they still got transformation. But if they broke down the nucleic acids, the transforming stopped. And they concluded from that, and I think in a very straightforward way, that the transforming principle that Griffith had discovered therefore must be some kind of nucleic acid. Now to me that's pretty good evidence, but interestingly in the 1940s that result wasn't widely accepted. Not for a couple of reasons. First of all, there was growing interest in protein biochemistry and a lot of people were still focusing on the importance of proteins. So there was a bias against believing it could possibly not be proteins. The other reason that people were critical, which is a fair criticism, is that the biochemical techniques that these uh, researchers were using were relatively novel techniques, and there was some argument that maybe they may not have destroyed all of the class of molecules that they thought they destroyed. Specifically, there was some suggestion that when they thought they broke down all of the proteins in one of these solutions, they didn't get them all. So there was no way for Avery and his colleagues to prove otherwise at the time, and so the issue stood. This is where the work of two other researchers came in about a decade later, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. In the early 1950s, Hershey and Chase took a very different approach to asking what the genetic material might be made of by looking at how a particular kind of virus worked. Let me give you some background. Viruses are not true cells. They're made instead of just an outer coat of protein with an inner core of nucleic acid. DNA in most cases, in some cases, RNA. So viruses are made of just two things. Now the way a virus makes its living is by attaching to a cell, say a bacteria cell, 
injecting something into that cell and taking over the machinery of the cell. So, for example, Hershey and Chase were working with a particular kind of virus called the T2 virus. That fact isn't important, but this was a bacteriophage, as we call it, a bacteria-eating virus, which makes its living by injecting something, taking over that bacterium, and using the protein-synthesizing machinery of the bacterium to make more viruses. So viruses can't replicate themselves. They have to take over another cell. Clearly, then, what a virus must be doing is injecting some information. That's the information that would cause the cell to be taken over. So what Hershey and Chase set out to do was to ask, what is it that these T2 viruses are actually putting inside the bacterium? Because that must be the genetic molecule. And there were only two candidates. And they were the two critical candidates that people were focused on, proteins and nucleic acids. Now, the trick was to figure out how to determine which part was being injected. It's a very simple con uh, experiment to propose conceptually, but like many experiments in biology and in science in general, the devil is in the details of trying to figure out how to make it work. Is it proteins or DNA that goes into the cell? Well, who, how can you look at that? Well, Hershey and Chase developed a very, very clever way to figure that out. They did this by radioactively labeling in a selective fashion, the proteins and the DNA that the um, uh, viral cell was made of. The way you do this, oh, so let me give you a little background. In proteins, sulfur is um, a fairly common component, a fairly common element. And there's a radioactive form of, of sulfur. This is S35. So what they could do is they could grow some T2 viruses in a medium that had a lot of this radioactive sulfur in it. And what would happen is, is that the viruses, as they reproduced, would incorporate sulfur into their protein coats. And that meant then that you could ask not where did the protein go, but where did the radioactivity go? And I'll show you how they did that in a second. Alternatively, they could label the DNA. They could grow the same kind of virus in a medium that had radioactive phosphorus in it. This is P32. Phosphorus is not found in proteins, but it's a major chemical constituent of DNA. So they grew viruses in a medium that either had radioactive sulfur or radioactive phosphorus, resulting in some viruses that had their proteins radioactively labeled and some proteins that had their pho or in some uh, viruses that had their nucleic acids radioactively labeled. And then this is what they did. In separate experiments, they added either the radioactively labeled sulfur viruses with the radioactive protein coat or the radioactively labeled phosphorus viruses with the radioactively labeled DNA. They either, uh, in both of these cases, they would give these viruses just a couple of minutes, enough time for them to attach to bacteria and inject whatever they're injecting. And then they would stop the whole process. It'd give them just enough time to inject, but not enough time to actually take over the cell and cause it to build more viruses. And after the end of that process, by the way, what happens is that the bacterial cell essentially explodes and all the viruses come pouring out. So they gave it only a few minutes, about 20 minutes, and then they would um, uh, put the solution in a blender, literally. And the idea is gently to blend these, and by agitating it, they could separate the the outer coats of the virus that had been attached to the bacteria from the bacteria cells. So the bacteria has a virus attached, it injects something in, the virus injects something into the bacteria, they give it just enough time to do that, and then they agitate the solution to break off the, the viral coats, separate them from the bacteria, and then they put this solution in a centrifuge, which spins the solution around, and because of the action of the centrifuge, the heavier stuff will go down to the bottom of the centrifuge tube, and this would be the relatively large bacterial cell bodies, and the lighter stuff, which would be all the fluids and also the outer coats of the very tiny viruses, would remain up in the solution. So if you, if you spin these things, if you sep uh, centrifuge them just right, you'll get a little lump of stuff at the bottom of the tube, what we call the pellet, and that's going to be all the bacteria. And then you'll have the rest of the fluid in the tube, which will include the viral coats. And then what they could do, very simply, is ask, where's the radioactivity? Because they could pour off the fluid in one thing and ask, is there radioactivity in the pellet? Or is there radioactivity in the fluid? 
what's called the supernatant, actually, to be technical. And what they found was that if they radioactively labeled the sulfur marking the proteins, which are what the coat is made of, the radioactivity was found in the supernatant, where the viral coats were. If you radioactively labeled the um, DNA with phosphorus, the radioactivity was found in the pellet, where the bacteria were. Now, this is a very simple result, but it took the world by storm because it showed incontrovertibly that what these viruses were injecting in the bacteria, in fact, what happened have, had to be the genetic material was nucleic acids, and specifically, in this case, DNA. Hershey and Chase published these results in 1952, and it really caused a lot of interest. In fact, a whole bunch of biologists then in 1952 said to themselves, we better take a closer look at nucleic acids. And this is something that I want to do right now. Let's take a look at nucleic acids and see what they're made of. And then we're going to start asking how they um, actually work. Okay, so I want to now take a look at the building blocks of nucleic acids. These are what we call nucleotides. In fact, this is one of the reasons that nucleic acids are, in a sense, relatively uh, simple. These nucleotides make a polymer, a string of, bil uh, of building blocks, but there are only four types of nucleotides. Just as we saw with the amino acids, the four kinds of nucleotides all have some things in common and one thing that differs for the four different types. Each, nucleic a uh, each nucleotide building block has a sugar. This is called a pentose sugar. It actually forms a ring. Bonded to one part of this pentose sugar is something that we're going to call a phosphate group. This phosphate group is just a phosphorus atom with a bunch of oxygen around it. Bonded to another part of the pentose sugar is what we're going to call a nitrogenous base. It's the nitrogenous base that differs from, nu uh, from nucleotide to nucleotide because there are four different kinds of nitrogenous base. Now, before we move on, I just want to point out one thing that will become useful later on to know, and that is that um, organic chemists like to number carbons. They actually love carbons because, of course, organic chemistry is all about carbon, so they don't even write carbons down when they're drawing little structures of molecules. If you just see an intersection between lines, you assume there's a carbon there, and then they'll figure out some system for numbering carbons. And so we can number the carbons in the pentose sugar around the ring, beginning at an oxygen that binds the two sides of that ring. It goes clockwise from one to five, with the last carbon sort of hanging off that ring, the fifth carbon. That's just something to keep in mind for later when we talk about how these nucleic acids form larger polymers. Now, there are four kinds of nitrogenous bases, and these can be classed into two different groups which differ in size. The pyrimidines have a single six-element ring that's made of carbons and nitrogens, hence the name nitrogenous base. There are two kinds of pyrimidines. We call them cytosine and thymine. The details aren't important, but these are two kinds of pyrimidines. The second kind of nitrogenous base are called purines, and these are bigger, and that's the point. They're a different size because they're actually composed of two rings. In addition to this six-element ring that the, that the pyrimidines are made of, there's an additional five-element ring that's attached on the side, and there are two kinds of purines, adenine and guanine. Now, we re usually refer to the different nucleotides that we find in nucleic acids by the single, single letter which designates the type of base that it has. So therefore we have A, G, C, and T for adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And this A, C, G, T, T, G, C, A, 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 G, C, etc. is the alphabet that actually we're all becoming familiar with as DNA sequencing is becoming more and more um, uh, commonly used in uh, the, our language. Now, the last point I want to make is that, and I can make this very simply, is that the way we get a polymer of nucleic acids is by chemically bonding a string of these nucleotides together. And we chemically bond them along the axis that's connecting the sugars and the phosphates. And this is where the carbon numbering system comes in. Because the fifth carbon of one nucleotide 
will be attached to the third carbon of the next nucleotide via an intervening phosphorus atom. So that means that we have a string of these nucleotides in the polymer that go sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. But more importantly, we can also define that string as a polarized string with a three carbon on one side and a five carbon on the other side that's available for bonding another nucleotide if we were to extend the sequence in either way. So just like the polymer that is a protein, there is an inherent polarization to the polymer that is a nucleic acid. That's the point we're going to pick up on next time when we begin to ask how could this relatively simple polymer with phosphoruses and sugars and hanging off at different kinds of um, nitrogenous bases serve as a code.